Our next presenter is Josh Rosenblatt. And I just want to say um, that he's an extraordinary physician. And um, I haven't really actually heard him speak before, but my interactions with him through the CRTC, through the Ketamine Clinic have been his level of of intelligence and care and thoughtfulness has really been quite remarkable. So I'm really, really interested to hear what he has to say tonight about ketamine and relate, related treatments as we talk about novel approaches to the management of treatment resistant depression. Go ahead, Josh. Thanks so much, David, and uh, for the warm introduction. And certainly it's been a pleasure sharing patients with you. Um, so we'll dive right in and we'll talk about uh, ketamine as one of these novel treatments for treatment resistant depression. Uh, here are my disclosures. Most pertinently, uh, I'm the medical director of the Canadian Rapid Treatment Center of Excellence, or the CRTC. Um, and uh, so we provide IV ketamine and intranasal S ketamine for treatment resistant depression. So, to that question in the chat as well about how do you access IV ketamine off label, on label, um, that would probably be easiest to, to just refer to the Canadian Rapid Treatment Center of Excellence. So, fairly easy to go on the website, crtc.com, if anyone's interested in making referrals, and happy to provide further details about that later. So the objectives for this talk are fairly straightforward. We're gonna look at the evidence for ketamine. We're gonna look at what are the types of patients that would qualify for ketamine and be appropriate to have ketamine for treatment resistant depression. And then lastly, we'll briefly touch on the emerging excitement around psychedelic treatments such as psilocybin and MDMA, which have certainly been front of mind and front of page for most uh, uh, media coverage right now. Uh, so we'll briefly touch on that as well. So to start off, as Roger alluded to, in treatment-resistant depression, after you've targeted the monoamine system from a dozen different angles with a dozen different monoaminergic antidepressants, the likelihood of yet another monoaminergic antidepressant working is very low. So we do get this diminishing returns after you try to target serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine from every different angle. It isn't really worthwhile to keep going down that road, or at least the chances of it working would be fairly low. So the first interesting and unique thing about ketamine is that it targets the glutamate system. Given that this is different from the monoamine system, this already starts to increase hope that maybe our numbers in terms of the response and remission rates in TRD will be better because we're not just targeting the monoamine system, but we're actually going after a whole new system. And just as we know with any disorder, with depression, there are many different types that we could never assume that everyone would, tar uh, that everyone would respond to targeting the same monoamine system. So first key point here is that the theory is there that given that ketamine targets glutamate, that this provides provides that hope that it may work for people when the monoaminergic antidepressants did not work. Now, it's nice to think about the mechanism, certainly from an academic perspective, it's very interesting, but the proof is in the pudding. Of course, the gold standard for efficacy is randomized controlled trials or RCTs. So in this meta-analysis, we looked at all the published RCTs up until last year, and we identified 21 randomized controlled trials. And I know this is a busy slide, this four spot showing the results of all those 21 RCTs. So to bottom line it for you, essentially what we found is that all 21 RCTs showed the same thing, that ketamine had rapid and robust antidepressant effects with a moderate to large effect size. Importantly though, route does matter. There has been some studies on oral ketamine. There's been studies obviously on intravenous ketamine and intranasal S ketamine. And these two may be comparable in some ways and different in other ways. So the level one evidence is only for intravenous racemic ketamine and intranasal S ketamine. Oral ketamine certainly is something that we're very interested in, but it's still an active area of investigation that does not yet have the degree of evidence that we have for IV ketamine or intranasal S ketamine. One of the most exciting things of this uh, meta-analysis and systematic review was finding that there was over 100 registered ongoing clinical trials. So what this means is that over the next five to 10 years, these 100 clinical trials are gonna be completed and publish their results. So over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna learn a lot more about ketamine and have a much better understanding about the effects of it and how to use it optimally. But even right now, 21 replicated randomized controlled trials showing rapid and robust antidepressant effects, uh, some very encouraging results uh, for this, uh, this new and completely novel treatment. Perhaps one of the most exciting results for ketamine is the mood independent anti-suicidal effects. So this is something also that's been very well replicated. So in this meta-analysis, Sam Wilkinson and his group at Yale looked at the participants that had suicidality at baseline. So for a point of reference, at day zero, at the beginning of the studies, everyone included in this meta-analysis had suicidality. 100% of them had suicidal ideations. 
one day after a single uh, ketamine infusion, and 55% of them had zero suicidal ideation. So not just reduction in suicidality, but zero suicidal ideations at all. And a week out, seven days out, we see that that's still persisting and even growing, where still around 50 to 60% of people have zero suicidal uh, ideations at all. And certainly this is something that I've had the pleasure of seeing firsthand um, treating hundreds of patients with IV ketamine, where it really is quite remarkable, where we have these patients where they've been feeling suicidal every day for the last 10 years. And then they come in after their course of ketamine, and it's quite surprising in the success stories where they say, for the first time in a decade, I'm not thinking about suicide. So it's almost like those thoughts are deleted and completely removed from their, their brain. And there is a tendency for people who have antidepressant effects to have the anti-suicidal effects as well, but it is mood independent as well. So it's interesting where we see this phenomenon in some of our patients where where they get mild antidepressant effects, but what's worked really well is they're no longer suicidal. So we do have some patients that continue with the treatment because it provides dramatic improvements in their quality of life because they're not riddled with suicidal thoughts um, uh, every day. And you know, we have, we have patients that are those types of frequent flyers that have been in the emergency room multiple times per week. And then thankfully it's been months that they haven't uh, you know, gone back to the emergency room because the suicidal ideations are, are, are gone. So very exciting piece here. And the other important piece to highlight is that the FDA recently approved S-ketamine nasal spray for depression with suicidality. So the evidence is there, the FDA approval is there, and it really is exciting that now we can talk about things that have anti-suicidal effects outside of just lithium and clozapine, which re were really the only two ones that we could say confidently reduce suicidal thoughts and reduce suicidality. Um, if you're interested in reading more about the evidence, um, uh, probably the best paper would be to look at our international consensus statement that was just published in the American Journal a couple of weeks back. Happy to share the electronic reprints for anyone that's interested. But essentially, this too highlights the level one evidence for IV ketamine and intranasal S-ketamine, rapid and robust antidepressant effects within hours to days. We talk about the side effects more so in that too, where there's the acute dissociative effects, uh, where you have uh, these out-of-body experiences, you have these feelings that things have slowed down or that colors are changing. So these typically aren't full hallucinations in terms of hearing voices or seeing things, but it's more this dissociation um, and this dreamlike state that people find themselves in. But importantly, the dissociation resolves within 10 to 20 minutes after finishing the infusion. So it's a 40 minute infusion and within 10 to 20 minutes, they're back to ground, they're no longer dissociating and they're feeling fine. Physically, transient increases in blood pressure would be very common and expected where there's about a 10 to 20 point bump in your blood pressure. Um, so this would be an important thing also for patients that have hypertension where we really need to make sure that their hypertension is adequately treated before they pursue their ketamine treatment. Nausea would be another common physical side effect that comes up. Um, as I mentioned before, important to not put all ketamine in the same category where route does matter, where there is significant differences and the evidence right now is only supporting the IV and nasal at this point. Um, uh, if you have a look at the consensus recommendations, you can also see some of just the practical recommendations where how do you implement this? What are some of the key things if you were to be running a ketamine clinic for you to consider for you to do this safely and effectively? Um, so definitely recommend that for further reading. As I alluded to, certainly there are big differences by route of administration. So a big point to emphasize here is just not to assume that just because it's the same molecule in oral ketamine compared to IV ketamine, that they're gonna work the same way. It certainly seems that for ketamine, there's an importance of having a burst effect where you have high levels of ketamine in your brain for a brief period of time, like in a 40 minute infusion. So this may or may not be replicated in oral or sublingual uh, uh, routes of administration. So it really needs to be put to the test with randomized clinical trials as well. So dramatic differences in bioavailability, dramatic differences in pharmacokinetics, and certainly dramatic differences in the degree of evidence that we have. A growing area of research for sure. I certainly hope that oral ketamine uh, is, comes to a point eventually where we can use it because from a scalability perspective, it's a lot easier than IV ketamine. But right now, a word of caution that it's not there. So if you're prescribing that, uh, there is significant uh, liability there uh, if you know, the evidence doesn't support it to the same degree. Another important thing to touch on is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, or CAP. Now, I want to be very clear here that specifically I'm referring to when people try to use ketamine as a psychedelic. 
So psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is when you give someone a psychedelic dose of, for example, psilocybin or MDMA, you support them through the experience, and then you do integration psychotherapy so that the drug is facilitating the psychotherapy. The active ingredient is the psychotherapy, but you're using the drug and the psychedelic experience to achieve the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve, that perhaps the defenses in people's brains were too strong, that was preventing them from optimally engaging in psychotherapy and achieving those outcomes. So that's specifically what I'm referring to when I say CAP or ketamine assisted psychotherapy, which is different from what Roger was speaking about earlier, where of course we want to combine our SSRIs and SNRIs with CBT and give people optimal outcomes by giving people the best of both worlds. So with ketamine assisted psychotherapy, the discussion is often around ketamine being the only legal psychedelic. So we are seeing more and more people taking this approach where they say, if ketamine is effective, it's obviously going to be more effective if we add in some um, uh, integration therapy and do CAP. But that's not necessarily true, and certainly based on the evidence, 22 RCTs now have supported the use of ketamine in the absence of integration psychotherapy, and there are zero RCTs to support the practice of CAP. This is important also because we need to be open to the possibility that ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, or CAP, might actually be inferior to ketamine on its own. The key reason for this is because in CAP, you're targeting dissociation, and dissociation is not associated with the antidepressant effects. So regardless of the quality or intensity of your dissociative experience during the ketamine treatment, that does not predict the antidepressant effect. So what's dangerous with CAP is when you're titrating the dose to a dissociative experience rather than titrating to an antidepressant effect. So this is when we run into these issues where people are being underdosed because they might be dissociating a low dose or more commonly end up being on extremely high doses because they keep increasing the dose to achieve that dissociative uh, episode. So uh, a word of caution here where Certainly, lack of research does not mean that it's ineffective, but at this point, it's not evidence-based, and the practice of titrating ketamine to a dissociative experience is really not something that would be um, safe or evidence-based at this point. But we certainly will see with time if, uh, if it does become an evidence-based treatment. Again, uh, highlighting that this is different from, for example, combining ketamine with something like CBT. So in this study, it was very interesting. They gave people ketamine infusions. They got them out of their depression. They were finally feeling motivated and focused enough to be able to fully engage in CBT and do their CBT homework. So there was this synergistic effect where they were able to engage more with CBT. So the antidepressant effects of the CBT were greater for these patients with severe treatment-resistant depression. And Conversely, the CBT was showing promise also for, uh, for helping to partly sustain the antidepressant effects from the ketamine. So this is different from CAP. This is certainly a promising area that we're very interested in. And so I just don't want to confuse these two concepts. So what I've shown you so far is the RCT efficacy data. And as we all know, RCTs do have a selection bias with the participants that are enrolled, where typically you wouldn't be enrolling people with severe personality disorders who've tried ECT, who've tried 20 medications, who are really unwell, who are actively suicidal. So looking at the real world effectiveness data is really important. And at the CRTC, where we do accept these incredibly complex patients, as long as they meet our eligibility criteria, we've been able to look at our data to try to see, does the RCT efficacy match up with the real world effectiveness? And thankfully, the answer is a resounding yes. So analyzing the first couple hundred patients that came through our clinic, what we see is self-report measures of depression dramatically and rapidly decrease. Suicidal ideations decrease as well. The GAD7, anxious distress symptoms also decrease. And very excitingly, and what we've seen um, for so many people is improvements in function. So the Sheehan disability scale in the work domain, in the social domain, and in the family domain, all improving over the course of only two weeks. So we've seen people that are on disability for years and are returning to work for the first time. Obviously that's not the outcome for everyone, but there has been very clear improvements in symptoms as well as functional improvements in anti-suicidal effects. So very pleased to see as we've been going through this process and treating people in our clinic that the RCT efficacy data translates very well into real world effectiveness data. In certain subpopulations, for example, in treatment-resistant bipolar depression, which Roger alluded to, we don't have that many options. Once you've gone through the three Ls, there's not a whole lot of evidence-based options after that. But what's very exciting with the first 47 patients that we came through our clinic with treatment-resistant bipolar depression, they had very positive responses where we get this incremental further reduction in depressive symptoms by the fourth infusion in the second week, we have 50% of people responding. And again, this is treatment-resistant bipolar depression, a malignant disorder that we all know is extremely difficult to treat. 
street. And thankfully, using these preliminary data, we were able to go to CIHR this round, and on our first uh, first round of application, uh, CIHR fully funded our large multi-site RCT, where we're, we're going to be comparing repeated doses of IV ketamine with IV midazolam to prevent the functional blinding. And this will be a large 100 participant study that we're recruiting at CRTC as well as at Toronto Western Hospital um, in the next, and that'll be launching in the next couple months. So certainly some excite, excitement that this may be helpful both for unipolar treatment resistant depression and bipolar treatment re resistant depression. So if it's primarily focused on intravenous ketamine data, but I do want to briefly touch specifically on intranasal S-ketamine, which was Health Canada approved in May of 2020 specifically approved for unipolar depression as an add-on treatment to an antidepressant and for people who have failed two or more antidepressants. So this is an augmentation um, uh, a treatment. Uh, we sometimes use it for off-label bipolar depression as well, uh, but primarily unipolar depression that have failed two or more antidepressant trials. So George Papacostas and his group at Mass, uh, Mass General uh, did this very nice meta-analysis pooling together all the S-ketamine studies, and they found that pooling together the studies using the, the protocol of twice weekly for four weeks they were able to achieve a 53% response rate and 39% remission rate for TRD. And again, this is TRD, not first episode depression. So based on the STAR-D results, we know that response and remission rates are around 10 to 20%, whereas for S-ketamine, we're seeing fairly encouraging numbers here with 53% response rates and 39% remission rates. What's even more exciting with S-ketamine is the maintenance data. So there has been multiple replicated phase three uh, maintenance studies now that went out for 52 weeks, and they were able to show that people who respond or remit to the acute course of intranasal S-ketamine have maintained antidepressant effects. So this is where IV ketamine data is lacking, where we don't have long-term data past the acute course of four to eight infusions, but the S-ketamine data is very encouraging that for people that had repeated doses every one to two weeks, it worked very well where tolerability and safety improved further over time, but effectiveness and efficacy was maintained over time. So very encouraging to show that ketamine and S-ketamine seem to get people well, but also keep them well with repeated doses. And certainly the holy grail right now is, is there other ways that we can maintain the antidepressant effects? But for right now, at least we know that it seems that ketamine and S-ketamine can maintain the antidepressant effects if you respond initially. So moving on to our next topic of who is ketamine appropriate for? So in our clinic, we focus on treatment-resistant depression because that is the only indication that has level one evidence. Certainly there's very promising data coming out, especially for PTSD, but right now, just because it's not that level one evidence, we're not offering it for that primary indication yet, but for people that have failed two or more antidepressants. The contraindications or exclusion criteria primarily have to do with the medical stability. So the biggest one that we see is uncontrolled hypertension. So since we know that ketamine will increase your blood pressure by about 10 to 20 points transiently, if you're coming into the clinic with a systolic blood pressure of 170, we're not going to be able to give you the ketamine because then it's going to shoot up to 190 to 200, and that's simply not safe. So we really need people to have their hypertension managed before they come to the clinic. Uh, similarly, cardiac decompensation and seizures that are untreated, since there is the risk, like other psychotropics, of ketamine lowering the seizure threshold, uh, these would be the important medical things to make sure that they're treated. Um, uh, pregnancy, because of the lack of data right now, there is a growing database on this, interestingly, but uh, because of the lack of data right now, that is a contraindication. Um, and substance use disorders within the past three months would also be a contraindication, which is interesting and might change over time because there is some interesting evidence coming out for alcohol and cocaine use disorders, where ketamine combined with motivational interviewing might be actually quite helpful. Very, but for right now, it still is a contraindication. Very importantly, comorbid personality disorders and active suicidality are not contraindications. We treat complex, difficult to treat, very sick patients. We have an infrastructure set up for that, and that's why we can do this safely, because these are the patients that need the, the treatment most. As a treatment for suicidality, it would, uh, it would be awful if we were cherry picking and excluding people that had suicidality. For personality disorders, we would not be prescribing ketamine for borderline personality, but if someone has comorbid major depressive disorder that's treatment resistant with comorbid borderline personality, we're not gonna turn them away simply because they're also struggling with borderline personality. We've had about 20 patients with full syndrome of borderline personality come through our clinic and their response rates have been very similar to everyone else. So it doesn't seem to be a negative predictive factor either. Uh, lastly, to finish up, classic psychedelics or serotonergic hallucinogens, certainly lots of excitement with the recent RCT showing um, the benefits of uh, psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression and MDMA for PTSD, but very important to note that these are not approved and cannot be legally prescribed. I'm continually surprised by patients and providers 
thinking that these are actually legally available, where you are hearing a lot of clinics coming out saying that they're psychedelic clinics, and that would make people think that, oh, I can go to a clinic and get psilocybin or MDMA or LSD, but they're still not legal. They're only available in clinical trials, and there is the Section 56 exemption, but that's only for people with terminal illnesses, and there's been a very small number of uh, exemptions granted. So it's not like you can just start applying for people with TRD and getting these exemptions on any sort of large scale. And no one with just pure TRD without cancer has been approved uh, for, for these exemptions. There's no evidence for microdosing, even though it's very popular, um, but, uh, but certainly stay tuned for, for more research in that area. Um, so there's a couple of just reference slides here as well and some good resources, but I'll, I'll leave it there at, at this point. Thanks so much. Josh, that was extraordinary. And not to mention that, I think you answered every single question in the Q&A, save and except for the ones that um, I'm gonna leave for Roger to answer after all the talks are given, which is what, are this, what is actually the state of ketamine clinics and ketamine treatment in Canada as of today and what the future holds. So um, please don't, don't worry, those questions are all gonna be addressed. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything that you didn't get because boy, that was really, really, really great. Um, So one of the things that you talked about was no history of substance abuse in the last three months. What about longer term? Like people that have had, people that have been clean and sober for a year, two years, five years. Yeah, so they would be certainly eligible for treatment. We don't kind of hold that against patients. Um, we do have very close monitoring for signs of addiction or misuse or things like that. Uh, patients are seen by psychiatrists at every visit for their treatment. So if they were intoxicated, we, we would catch it. Um, so three months is uh, kind of the, the balance of making sure that people are uh, having some degree of stability while not creating barriers where certainly, you know, these are the patients that often need it most where substance use disorder, bipolar disorder, these often go hand in hand. Uh, so that would not be an exclusion criteria as long as they have uh, three months that they've been in, in remission for. So I think this actually speaks to something that's a bit of an elephant in the room, which is that I think there's a lot of people who the first time, they, this is the first time they've ever heard of ketamine in any context other than street use. And that that may be where the concern about addiction comes from. Can you, do you, can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. And so with any substance, we usually talk about the capture rate, which would be the percentage of people that become addicted to a substance after using it one, so some, one time. So for example, something like heroin would have a capture rate of 50%, uh, whereas ketamine is way, way on the other end, where we're talking about less than 5% risk of uh, addiction. Um, and certainly uh, things like ketamine dependence and all these things are extremely low risk. And the, the big thing here also is they are exclusively receiving doses in a clinic. So they don't have the opportunity to start upping their dose on their own, like what happens with opioids and benzodiazepines. Um, it's pretty hard for me at least to conceive and based on seeing these patients that if you're coming in, for example, once a month for a ketamine infusion, it's hard to think about that being an addiction. Um, so it's very well controlled and we are monitoring it for it. I think there's been one patient of the 350 people that we come through where I started to wonder, you know, are they enjoying it too much? So we took a pause to try to see things, but, uh, you know, signs or symptoms of substance use disorders is really not something that we see coming up in our clinic, thankfully, even though, you know, it's certainly a concern that we need to, to monitor closely and, and have a good, uh, uh, a, a good caution for. That's great. And just one last quick question. Um, what's the state of people being people outside of like, what do you have to do to be able to prescribe intranasal ketamine? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, there is um, uh, an, an additional training that you need to do through Janssen's journey. Uh, so you need to actually become uh, a kind of licensed prescriber of S-ketamine and there's no take home doses. So S-ketamine needs to be uh, uh, administered in a clinic with a healthcare professional monitoring it. So this is one of the interesting things also that we really need to think about because ketamine and S-ketamine is a team sport. It's really hard to do just on your own if you're a sole practitioner. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to build where yes, you need the limited uh, license to be allowed to prescribe S-ketamine. You need to do the training, but you also need a facility where you can safely administer it and do the monitoring because it's two hours of monitoring every time and an acute protocol is twice weekly for four weeks. So that is quite time intensive for healthcare professionals to do that monitoring. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's how you basically uh, are able to, uh, to prescribe it. That's great. Thank you so, so much. And again, all the questions about the CRTC and clinics and what services they provide and so on and so forth, we're going to let Roger address that at the, at the end. So Josh, thanks a million.